edition of the podcast of the real world meets the digital world as we explore the intersections of social computing and AI. Let's welcome our host, Andrew Ballard. Over to you, AB. Well, g'day and welcome to Spatial. This is episode 21. We are back after a minor hiatus. Yes, winter colds and perils did come our way, that kind of thing. That's what happens in this part of the world, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I have with me, though, uh, a beaming smile. Um, 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 Alison Keeley, welcome to Spatial and so glad to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. Lovely to be here. She is. Well, look, um, I'm going to say, uh, it was, uh, I had to look back. It was two months ago. I saw your LinkedIn profile saying, I have just been, you know, I've changed roles and I'm now the, I'll, I'll give it a go, but you need to uh, correct me, the director for the, and here we go, yes, the Institute, no, I got it wrong, the Innovative Planet Institute. Goodness me. Um, can we start there? Can you tell us what the Innovative Planet Institute is, what your role is, and yeah, what's been on your plate the last little bit? Yeah, well, I'm I'm two months into the role at Swinburne University, um, where they've established uh, an, a new institute called the Innovative Planet Institute, and I'm the inaugural director. The inaugural, the the inaugural, the, the, the in, in, inaugural. Well done. Yes, <laughs> lovely. And so it gives it, it it gives it a chance to build itself into what I'm calling um, sustainability at Swinburne. This is really where Swinburne wants to provide, you know, its people and technology solutions to addressing a, a wide range of um, uh, sustainability challenges that the world is facing right now and framing it in the context of the UN SDG Sustainable Development Goals to do that. Wow, that's phenomenal. It's uh, So you say it's a brand new institute within Swinburne University. Um, I do know, I do read LinkedIn quite a lot. Swinburne just got a lovely uh, press release last week. They've climbed the worldwide in Australia and Victorian in Australia university ranks. They're definitely uh, top 50, uh, top three in Victoria, I think. So numbers are going up, which is a glorious sign. Um, joining the ranks of other institutes within Swinburne, is it a, um, a brand new facet silo or is it going to be cross uh, collaboration across the Swinburne um, ecosystem? Look, you know, the, the, there's a there's three other institutes at, at Swinburne, and obviously, to develop um, solutions that address sustainability problems, you can't do that in one institute. So there's obvious connections into things like the space and health and defence and all of these platforms, data, AI, all of these things coming together, and so it's it's a real opportunity for Swinburne to leverage, which is what is really powerful capability for a small for a small university um, into really make an impact. Ah, batting above its weight. Lovely yes. to hear. So what are the sort of the uh, pillars within the institute that you're going to be driving? What are the what are the focuses, the foci? Yeah, so I've kind of set, set centered it around four four key pillars, and those four key pillars are um, energy transitions, so looking at how we achieve, you know, zero emissions, um, supply chain decarbonisation, yeah. uh, future living. How do we build cities of the future so that they're not just smart, but they're they're regenerating as well? Um, uh, a subject matter called geo resilience. Hello. I love the word, but that's because I love the word geo and I love yeah. the word resilience. And Lovely. I put them together. You know, it, it's about people and communities and building resilience. Um, as we face more and more of the effects of climate climate action and cut through climate change. Lovely. And then the other one is to do with transport and looking at how we would make transport smarter, which obviously fit, fits with my role previously in the Department of Transport and Planning. Very cool. Um, I also note with interest, um, we were delayed from when I first spoke to you when you launched in this new role by a couple of uh, European conferences. Uh, well done for having to do the work to travel to that part of the world and spend time. Well done. Um, can you give us a look? Um, what's what's your background, your fields? How, how did you not be in this role? But but what are the, the, the sort of the um, the science journey or the um, uh, career path that's led you to these types of things that are um, um, front of mind? Yeah, look, you know, I started with, um, I'm, I'm originally from Trinidad. Um, so I started with a land surveying degree in Trinidad, and then I did a PhD in something called geodesy. 
um, okay. over in the UK, and then I moved to Australia. So my background is really in in satellite positioning. Mm-hmm. So looking at things like um, positioning, navigation, timing solutions, which has now taken me into the world of quantum. Um, I saw that. So, yeah, so quantum Very exciting. sensors Goodness. and the potential for quantum sensors to play a role in navigation and positioning in areas where GPS doesn't work. Um, and so that that's my science journey. That's my passion. It is in geodesy and positioning. And so currently I get a chance to use a whole range of brand new technologies and sensors in order to do that as well, but then leverage that into the applications where GPS would normally be work working but if it doesn't then what do we do to secure our banking infrastructure our trains everything gotcha gotcha Uh, we had a chat with um phil last episode and one of the nuggets he left was how the australian um gps network is being built up to be even more um uh yeah um exacting and also the coverage um to be made better and the number he put out there was you know, billions of savings proposed future, but still um, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you've got some serious money on the, on the table. Is this, um, is this the brave new world of expanding uh, the positioning around the world? Or is it, as you say, what are the kind of places where positioning is not covered by, um, you know, those uh, constellations of uh, satellites flying just above our heads? So it's, it's two things, Andrew. It's one is, um, it's anywhere that you can't see the satellite signals. So in tunnels, underground, mm-hmm. um, indoors, those sorts of environments. But then there's the other thing of when you have applications that are safety critical, like our trains, and we want to make sure that we have a solution that is really, really one we can trust, then you want something else there that helps you do that. And these alternative technologies help you to provide that trust in positioning that is required for these yeah, gotcha. applications. So complete secondary technologies or supporting technologies around the GPS framework? I think you need both. I think you need an augmentation like the space-based augmentation system that Australia has just invented, um, yeah. invested in, South Pan. And then the, you need alternatives that aren't subject to the same uh, errors as, as the satellite signals are. So you have an independent system as well. Gotcha. And I can reveal I was also in a European country a little while ago that uh, is a known hotspot for GPS spoofing. So I dare say oh. these technologies are also to combat uh, trust yeah. in said signals yeah. and am I really where I am or should I just play away to the ground? So yeah. gotcha. The security mm-hmm. aspect is mm-hmm. significant. Uh, I take it this conversation does have implications in that kind of space. Yeah, so it's, you know, the, 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 the quantum PNT problem is one that defense is very interested in. Sovereign PNT capabilities mm. is one that Australia is very interested in, as are other countries around the world. And we're seeing lots and lots more the impact of spoofing um, in, in certain areas, which, you know, creates that unreliability and mistrust. Yeah. Yeah, and a million mistrusts a second does tend to make a uh, signal processor confused. And if it's confused, that's not a state you want to be in. Yeah, I think I saw a number somewhere in the U.S. where if they lose GPS for a day, it costs about a costs about a billion dollars. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah we are talking. We are talking. What was uh, military only technology in the eighties? I want to say. Yeah. Uh, and then was first released commercially but uh by bricks i guess bigger than our mobile phones of that era i still my father did have a mobile phone in that era and you know carried around the suitcase of the battery with it um the gps you know the fact that it's everywhere and augmented and we just rely on it and it's also uh, you know the uh the number of uh, constellations that we can tap into is now increased Huge. although yeah. perhaps there might be a few less in the future that's a conversation for something else. That's that's all right. Um, maybe getting back to the planet, uh, the um, um, innovative planet institute. Um, yeah. What are the first few things you're doing? What's on your What's on the dance card? The rest of this 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 year. What's the? Um, is it uh, you're looking for um, uh, partners? You're looking for projects. You're looking for um, other students and building up teams. What's 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 the first What's the first hundred days? 
look like? Yeah, the first 100 days is actually, oh, which is rapidly coming to an end. I know, that's say it's already been two months. So um, what's yeah, the next so the 100 days? 100, <laughs> it's really about, um, you know, I'm new to Swinburne, build, building those partnerships with within Swinburne. You'd be amazed mm-hmm. at the fact that that is, that is a thing to it's be done. It's own challenge. Um, yep, gotcha. Yeah. So it, it's, it's doing a lot of matchmaking. Um, okay. Some serious coffee, as I dare say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of blind dates in Swinburne okay. to try and just kind of um, get the right people into the right room, into the room with the right questions. So I think one of the things I'd like to focus on is what does impact mean for an institute like this? And impact for me is about how do we get the innovation into the hands of the people who need it? So the decision makers, is it society? It's unlocking it from where it kind of sits. So, you know, it's getting technology and it's getting people and it's putting them together and saying, um, what is the best way to to provide a solution to this this challenge? And, you know, that's that's language. You know, everybody's speaking a slightly different language vocabulary. It's it's really it's really kind of a um, a collaborative endeavor that 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 reads, re- requires a little bit of finessing. Lovely. No, no, no. But it's everyone has their own lens. Uh, yeah. If you come from a certain field, everything you know, hammer looks like a nail. But also, um, to communicate the values, the ethos is is always a hard thing. Even to figure out what that is, but then to you know say it clearly, plainly is um, a great thing. Um, so is is the goal of um, the – are we going to be calling it the IPI, the Innovative Planet, uh, Planetary Institute? Is it going to be a short name, a long name, an acronym forming here, or we keep it correct I first and well? I think I'm going to keep it correct. Okay, this is um, good. I know Australians like to shorten <laughs> – Yes. Shorten their names. I'm going to keep it. Well, I'm going to keep it says formal. Says AB. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to keep it formal. Um, very good. Uh, but within it, we will have a lot of very, very, very informal conversations and relationships developing in <clears throat> order to achieve the kinds of output that I think really presents itself as an opportunity for Swinburne. Lovely. As well. No, fantastic. Uh, do you have um, a premises, um, a level, a room, a building um, carved out? Are you operating virtually? What's the what's the what's the what's the future land grab of the uh, uh, institute? Yeah, land grab is a good 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 ninety day <laughs> plan. I have, have to you, say. Have you cited which exactly <laughs> place you'd like uh, to work at? They've given me a lovely office in the Brilliant. engineering building, which is mm-hmm. um, which houses me, uh, which is great. It is a virtual institute. Um, And that's been brilliant given everything we've learned during COVID. Um, You know, I don't know what what it would have been like before that, but given the experiences of COVID, it's a really lovely platform for engaging with much more people, increasing the diversity of participation by purely making this a a virtual interaction um, as well. And so in terms of space, we have a lot of space at the Horse on campus that, you know, works really well. We've, um, I've stumbled across a beautiful visualization hub full Excellent. of um, big monitors and screens in which you can run a lot of um, spatial, spatial problems, um, digital twins, mm-hmm. um, AI on digital twins, and invite people in. So, you know, if I could tell people using this podcast, you know, if you want to come in and play in our, our spaces, we've got some beautiful spaces for co-designing uh, solutions. Absolutely. I uh, would love to second that. I, I haven't yet played in that area. I do uh, operate around the Swinburne area every now and then. So I will take you up on that offer to go and play. But it is such a vital part. Um, there's a lot of talking about ways to communicate and show deep, nested, 3D, dense, gnarly problems. But there's nothing quite like experiencing it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what the ratio of well, if a picture tells a thousand words, I don't know what the ratio of spatial intelligence is to words. But I really don't want to write a twenty-page thesis versus mm-hmm. come and put this headset on or come and come and play with me, and we'll and we'll find that in five minutes. Obviously, the speed of knowledge transfer is much different for certain problem sets. Yeah, and you know, a spatial person trying to show a planner. Um, the impact of something happening or a building being built or yes. one decision-making process, it's much more interactive to see 
um, what the effect of that. And if you think about, you know, the future where you could layer onto that um, AI, where you don't even have to play around with computers, you can just tell it to yes. show us certain things, you know, then you have a really powerful narrative environment for, um, you know, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary um, interactions. I've been in a lot of digital spaces for a very long time, I would say how long, but back in the early days of G, even Photoshop and imagery, I many times had someone say, excellent, can you move, can you, can you move that to the left? Yep, 10 seconds, done. Can you move it up? Yep, come back tomorrow. Yeah. Hang on, didn't you just do that? Yeah, it's there's 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 some things are easily done in some places and others are that's a grand right that that's a grand up rewrite um, and it's really lovely to separate the technical and let the technical happen but have people just come in the front end and ask the questions unfettered and obviously these sort of spaces being um, uh, you know multi screen multi collaboration and in a world with multiple headsets all working together that mode of uh, I can tell you, I can talk you through it, or I can just show you and, you know, let's experience it. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, and experiencing is something like that together, I think will open up more dialogue. It will it will encourage more conversation about um, what is possible, yeah. you know, so intent and context and all of these things become conversations when you move beyond technology. Yeah, indeed. The tech is changing so fast. It's, it's nice to keep the right handle on it. But as you've been saying in your first hundred days, it's the talking, it's the, it's the trying to piece together what's the aim, what's the plan. And this is easily doable in X. This is, oh, let's put that on the long, the long path. And the other end of the stick is often that thing. Yeah, that's a button on your phone now. Um, it's easily done. So the pace of change is, is I'm glad to see you're harnessing it and using it as best you possibly can. Oh, absolutely. I'm so excited. It's, um, it changes so fast. Um, and so, you know, I, I tell people, I remember when I started using GPS and there were only a few satellites in the sky and you had you to, had to wait until it acquired. <laughs> Hang on, there's one coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Now, uh, look, when I fly a DJI drone, it connects to two or three satellite networks and, oh, it's got 14. It kind of should know where it is reasonably well that's untenable yes as you say 20 years ago that was back in our day okay there we go kids we've yeah. we've said it now yeah <laughs> no um um so i've I, I can see five research programs you've got here on the website all the links in the uh the show notes and we can do we can do text overlays screenshots later that's easily done but future places for living urban infrastructure urban decision making wow can you tell me about those sort of problems that you're looking to solve um yeah. <laughs> what, what size scale uh yeah. <laughs> micro i mean what what are the definitions of the problems that you're trying to look at yeah i should also add that in my 90 days i will be doing an, a website update <laughs> and... okay gotcha uh, asterisk so... <laughs> this information may change between you and me yeah, so okay. i mean i guess a, a previous incarnation of the institute was to do with smart cities ah gotcha gotcha right? hence that focus so so many of these things have collapsed into one of those pillars that you were talking about innovative before innovative planet and allowed us to yeah. increase the scale of what we do so we will still keep the smart cities um focus and and pivot to something along the lines of future living you know create an affordable housing creating green housing that is affordable um, those kinds of, of challenges will form part of what, what future living is going to be. Um, but we will extend that into, well, how do we build transport networks that support new communities? And, and how do we manage energy and supply energy to cities of the future? And, and what does that mean for us um, as, a, as a society in terms of skills and workforce planning for the future as well? That's exciting. That. That's a massive remit. Um, that's that's not a small task. So obviously you're jumping in with two feet. Uh, yeah. Um, as, uh, as I say, I'll come back to the question of, of what's what's um, what's what's the rest of this year to formulate and plan and prepare, and then what's your goals for 2025? What would you like to be doing if we had this chat again in 12 months time? So for the rest of the year, I'm, I'm looking at building up a, a key set of programs. Um, one of which is obviously aligned with quantum 
um, looking at where um, Swinburne can position itself in delivering to the different roadmaps that are being created in Victoria nationally and internationally. That is one 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 thing. We also have the um, the the French Australia um, energy transition hub being being um, initiated uh, across universities, across industry sectors between France and Australia. And wow. so looking at how we would um, build that into uh, really harnessing international collaboration um, as well as local uh, intellect to deliver that and what those programs might look like. Um, and so those two plus actually getting the, the institute bedded down and working um, is going to be a, a really important thing. And for next year, I think, you know, I'd really like to position ourselves to um, where Swinburne is seen as a, a key accelerator of the SDG goals. And so, you know, when we're talking about this next year, Andrew, which I hope we are, and sure. you visit in our, and you visit in our hub, um, yep. what you'll be seeing is that we've created the, the pathways and the partnerships yeah. that are actually allowing us to, to, to do more rapid um, not just new innovation, but actually getting innovation out of the university and into the practitioner's hands as well. Oh, that's very good. And that's more about policy and standards and, and all the things that have to happen. Yeah, lovely. Can I, can I uh, twist your arm to talk about the buzzword bingo that we just got our viewers and listeners to tick off their bingo cards? Can we go back to quantum? Um, yes. It definitely is. Yeah. It's a big word. It's if you can't say um, AI and quantum in any marketing brochure or website, you're sort of, you know, what are you doing? Um, can you tie together both what you're doing with the Institute and quantum, Swinburne, but also your studies and the conferences I've been watching you do with living vicariously through your uh, LinkedIn photo reel, um, uh, quantum p &T. Can you explain to us what that word means in that context? Uh, what it's distilled down to, or what that one word, if you can unpack it, is it is it just marketing? What is the what's the core of it? Okay, so the the core of quantum, and I'm not a quantum physicist, Book. right? So I, I that's my disclaimer. Is there a quantum so physicist like, in the room? No, that's okay. <laughs> I'm oddly good. married to one, so there sometimes is. Okay. Um, we, we, um, well, good. But but in this case, I, I think what I'm interested in is is just the, the sensors that allow us to do more accurate measurements. So when we talk about quantum, we're talking about sensors that are typically able to, to, to perform measurements with very, very little error really? in it. And so what that means is we have the ability to do things like measure um, acceleration very, very precisely. And doing that very precisely means that we're able to measure things like the magnetic field, we can measure things like gravitational effects, we can measure a lot of sensing parameters. So, so just to be clear, when people talk about quantum, they sometimes talk about quantum computers, mm -hmm. or they talk about quantum communications, you know, more yep. secure communications. When I talk about quantum for things like positioning and navigation, I'm talking about um, sensors. Gotcha. And you're, you're right? using quantum in the sense of the word of the smallest increment possible. Yes. So quantum being beyond yeah. micro being the smallest measurements, the most precise. Gotcha. Yeah. So error is reduced and then that is added up, averaged to let us humans know, but on the smaller scale, you're doing the lowest level math, science, physics to make that happen. Yeah. And so what it allows us to do is measure things like understand how the gravity field of the earth is changing, which is really important for our mineral exploration mm. and for some of the geodesic work that we do. But the accelerometers that are being built using quantum physics, they're actually allowing us to do things like navigation um, underwater, for example, yeah. um, very, very accurately. Um, because GPS isn't going to work underwater, it's a great alternative tool. And so that, that's where, and you're right, you can't get away. If you're not saying quantum into, in every conversation, are you even doing science, Andrew? That's it. <laughs> How do you possibly get funded if you don't sprinkle one of those three, four, five words into any? Yeah, no, and 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 that and that that's just it. It's it's um, 
it's tricky when that is the actually correct word and it's meaningful and pushing the boundaries of science correctly versus the startup in the garage that says we're doing quantum AI, synthetic, cyber, yada, yada, and you're just lightening. Every word, sadly, is loaded and has multiple lenses on it. So it's, it's great to unpack that. Thank you for that. Also, thank you for uh, telling me the precise uh, pronunciation of geodesy. Uh, as someone who sees these words more than more than says them, um, it's was it, it's always hard to put the emphasis on the right syllable and geodesy or geodesic. Obviously, it's just the pronunciation changes depending on the word, but uh, geodesy and yeah, it's it's um, it's there's there's many, and this is the internet catching up with the world of you know I read more than I talk, so it's it's often hard to thank you for um, helping with that. That's really good. Um, could you actually define geodesy as a field and and how it relates and how it's permeated throughout the things that you're playing with now? Yeah, so geodesy is actually the study of the size and shape of the Earth and the positions of things on the Earth. Good so sure. it's the fundamental property that we use for determining things like um, where are our property boundaries, um, you know, how, how do we know where things are when we give it coordinate values? It sets up what is called the datum mm -hmm. against which we're able to to do things on a global scale. Um, gotcha. And so it's the foundation of maps. It's the mm -hmm. foundation of um, navigation systems. It's the core piece of information that allows us to understand um where things are um, on the surface of the earth. So, you know, when we hear things like Australia is moving seven centimeters Northward. to the northeast, mm, northeast. You know, gotcha. the, yeah, the reason we're able to say these things is because we've defined a reference frame that allows us to detect those kinds of movements. And so geodesy is that is that study. And we have a worldwide skill shortage of geodesists. So this is my pitch for anybody Excellent. who has an interest <laughs> in this. This is the place to think about it. <laughs> it wasn't a course in my career's counseling in high school. Um, was it for you and for others? Is it a is it a science first, then specialize? Is it a specialized university that teaches geoscience, geodesy, or is it Where's the, what is the career path? This is not no, a field that I'm, no. there aren't many geod, hang on, uh, there aren't many geodesists. Well, you have to tell me what the collective noun is for. Yeah, there's not many geodesists. They're even less. They, they normally came through a land surveying program, which is okay. why I did geodesy. But even the land surveying programs, we're seeing a lot of them dwindling, not just in Australia, but nationally, internationally. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's a global problem, mm. this this shortage. And it, and it is recognised. Um, so yeah, you'd have to, you know, there is no geodesy course that you sign up for. You do gotcha. bits of it in physics, you do bits of it in space science, you do bits of it in, in, um, uh, geomatics or in surveying, but you know, it, there is no course called geodesy and geoscience Australia does a lovely internship program where people can go and learn about geodesy as well. Um, but yeah, it is, it is one of one of the things that I do like to tell people, you know, we've actually see people, you know, when you take up your phone and you're using a map on your phone with GPS, you're using geodesy, right? It's mass market geodesy we're talking about now. And so we need to get more, more people interested in going ahead. And I hear you. It. I hear you. That's um, a lovely ad. And it is, it is true that, uh, you know, just as you think you're, I'm in, I don't know, to start up high school or in um, uh, primary school, I'm going to be a doctor or a lawyer and your horizons open. Um, I've watched my kids go through um, uh, university with good and firm ideas, but still no one even knows what's at the end of those, you know, choices three and four years later. And it's great to see that these are specializations within within deep fields. Yeah. Um, I, I did a startup a decade ago called My Perfect, uh, basically it was the opposite of Google with yeah. rather than starting with a search engine and having millions of results, you'd start yeah. with lots of results and play 20 questions till you got down to your perfect thing. The best one of all was My Perfect um, um, uh, career. It was actually neat that it asked questions that split the field really quite 
wildly and came up with a thousand different choices of what you should do. And it was kind of fun to play my own game of what should I have been or what should I have done? Because if you don't know, you can't make a choice. So it's always good to find out that there is more options out there than what you could possibly think of until you're halfway through. So brilliant. Yeah, I've got two kids. One just started uni and one's in year 11. Um, and yeah, it's a really interesting conversation to have with them, yep. uh, given all the choice yes. that yes. they do have now um, and trying to inspire them into STEM yep. related areas. It's it's a challenge still. Yeah, it is. It is. No, I'm, I'm wrapped to hear. Um, uh, can we even walk back a little bit more? Um, you talked about another, well, an acronym which you explained, but it is all over your LinkedIn sure. field, and that is PNT, Position Navigation Timing. Obviously, that's an acronym that is so frequently said it's turned into an acronym. Um, what is the international focus on it, or is uh, geodesy the underlying maths and PNT is the daily application? What's the, what's the um, linkage between the two? Yeah, geodesy is the underlying, inf you know, the, the, the sort of theoretical infrastructure under which positioning, navigation, and timing is. It sets up all those kinds of reference frames mm. within which we make measurements of positioning, navigation, and timing. The PNT aspect of it refers to the um, the app the applications, um, the technologies, and the, the the systems that are used to provide position, navigation, and timing. So satellites, for example, would be part of that PNT uh, architecture, gotcha. um, where quantum clocks are now part of the the timing and uh, architecture as well. But underpinning all of these would be the the infrastructures of geodesy. Gotcha. Goodness me. Um, with more satellites up there, um, are you able to make use of the low Earth orbit constellations? The the Starlink is the classic one, but there's a lot of um, uh, there's many frameworks of, uh, we, well, uh, it's a large place up there, but certainly it's getting much more crowded. Um, um, is that adding influence and is that adding its own level of um, um, uh, accuracy to the conversations or is it the ground base systems like we've talked about previous um, with Phil, but also is it the actual uh, underlying hardware and the techniques software based on the ground that are actually helping to really bridge these gaps between where we want to be and where we are today? Oh, funny you should lead me down this oh. pathway, Andrew, because Excellent. I'm going to say that the thing that I fundamentally adhere to <laughs> uh -oh. is the idea of fusion, right? Um, so I don't think there's going to be any one, one al algorithm, any one um, technology, hardware technology. It's not going to be any one thing that provides the answer to the increasing number of applications we're trying to service with positioning and timing. Ooh. So I think for me, anything that, that, that comes up low Earth orbit in satellites, quantum, whatever it is, it's, it has strengths and it has weaknesses. And the way we maximize and optimize over this is we combine them together. Yeah. And the mechanism we use to combine them comes down to what the application needs. So if the application needs are high accuracy and high trust, then we should be able to sample from our, our little toy box of things. No, I it's a box and, of chocolates. And grab, and grab everything we need to give us that solution. Boom. Whereas if we're not so interested in accuracy, it's on our mobile phones, we just want to get to a restaurant. You know, that's a different different type of class of application that I think we're talking about. So yes. uh, for me, the lower the orbit in satellites offer a lot of opportunity for us. Um, it comes with its own complexity as well. You know, you need a lot of them mm. as well um, to cover areas. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's all part of a hierarchical solution. So for me, you have things on the ground you have things in the middle of the air, so drones and things like that. Yep. You have things near space, high altitude balloons, and then you start to have things in space. Mm. And these are the layers of sensing and capability that we have to help build our solutions for things here on Earth. And they all have to work together synergistically. Very cool. Um, that's great to hear because that means you're not putting all eggs in one basket. You're just opening up to whatever comes along and... Um, 
I guess a a um, a, a, um, um, a follow up is what sort of year on year benefits are you hoping for, or what are the metrics you're seeking or seeing? Are you seeing um, we're getting better tolerances? Are you seeing we're getting better trust? What's a what's a five or ten year view? I think a five or ten year view um, starts off with something as simple as sovereign. Um, you know, I, I think the five or ten year view has to be what is Australia's uh, sovereign capability in this area, but also what is Australia's contribution to the global, you know, toy box. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, what what are we doing? Um, and then, you know, there is also this idea of, um, you know, where can Australia position itself to benefit from some of the things that are happening internationally. So um, one of the things I've been working on is this space and spatial roadmap, where um, spatial, which has always been uh, a user of space technology, can now leverage the greater investment in space sensing to deliver a greater downstream benefits for things like bushfires and um, emergency response and climate change and things like that. Um, So I'm hoping that we'll see intelligence and AI become some of the offerings that Australia and Victoria in particular, I'm really trying to get Victoria as the smart state to catch on, um, you know, so that we build intelligence solutions that are almost technology and sector agnostic. Mm. Mm, Lovely. Um, Look, as a, um, as a fellow um, Victorian, I support that. That's, that's all good. I, if I have a conversation with someone in Sydney, I will have to change my tune. That's okay. This is just the classic Australian debate of, um, you know, who's got a well, who's got the best footy team is generally the fact that it works. Um, uh, what's what's uh, the what's um, you'll be dealing with projects and uh, partnerships? Are you looking to onboard students and uh, directly have? Active projects, or is it more? Is the um, uh, is more outward facing um, partnerships and uh, projects? Is it is it outside Swinburne? Is it bringing up people through Swinburne and releasing them, or is it to grow the institute and be a powerhouse of R and D? Look, I think Swinburne has a, a a real brand in providing technology solutions uh, outward facing. Mm. Um, it's one of their their, their moonshots, you know. Every, every industry partner gets a technology solution. Um, and so I, I think that's where their brand is really um, strong. And so I'm really keen to really do that, that partnership building with goals and impact in mind. But I don't think we can do that without um, uh, building up the workforce that can support that technology-rich future as well so it has to be done both ways but the idea would be that we have students who are working very closely with industry as well so that they're building up not just the the theoretical and academic skills but they're also getting that um, on the job training that helps them to build out um, the support that the industry will need. Yeah brilliant love it. Alison thank you so much Awesome to chat to you. Um, I've got to say it's opened my eyes and my ears to the kinds of things that are on the horizon. Obviously, drawing together such a, I mean, the field of view of the um, the Bantry, um, um, um Institute is obviously so much bigger than, 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 yes, first website look, but also that vision for the future is just glorious to hear. Um, where do you, you've, I've, we asked where the, where the field is for um, PNT, but where do you think the institute will be in five years' time? What's the not the fifty-year time? That's you know we've all got matrix-style jacks in the back of our head, and we're all wired into the central thing. Where's the where's the sensible first horizon that you'd just love to be? Um, I think I would like to be able to point to a few things that has made society um, better. Yeah. You know, I would like to see some of the work that we've done actually being used. Um, in creating uh, better better resilience, um, you know, meeting the needs of the most vulnerable people in society today. Um, mm. And I think if we were able to even do a little bit of that, that's what I would think we have, we're on the right track. Brilliant. Oh, that's heartwarming to hear. And it's perfect to, uh, 
Perfect to finish with, Alison. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll leave contact points, your LinkedIn profile. We'll leave a link to the website. Looking forward to seeing a version 1.1 or 2.0 release. That's all great. But it's really heartening to hear that vision and uh, um, the passion come through. Um, we all fully support it. Even if we're not in Victoria, Australia, um, obviously there's ways to get in, to get, uh, in touch and get um, involved. So thank you for your time. Really, really brilliant to have that chat to you. And congratulations and welcome to the directorship of the Energy Planet Research Institute. Alison Keeley, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. That's it from now. Catch us all next time. Next time, more interviews coming through. This is perhaps going to be the format going forward. So we're looking forward to um, having some more of these kinds of chats. Cold's notwithstanding. Yes, it is cold in this part of the world. Heat is on. Cats are hibernating. But from us at um, Spatial, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. If you'd like more news and insights about Spatial AI, or have a story or interesting topic you'd like us to cover, reach out to us. And better yet, come and join the community at Spatial. All the links are in the show notes.